Hi, my name is Katie Bickley. I am Jack Williamson's great niece, and I'm going to be reading The Metal Man, which was his first published short story. The Metal Man stands in a dusty basement corner of the Tyburn College Museum. Though the first excitement has subsided, his placement there is still an uneasy academic compromise, which so far has saved him from the scientists who want to cut him up for biochemical analysis and the old friends who think he should be buried. To the casual tourist, he is only a life-sized piece of time-greened bronze. A closer look shows the perfect detail of his hair and skin and the agony frozen on his face. A few visitors stop to frown at the peculiar mark on his chest, a red six-sided blot. People have almost forgotten now that he was once Professor Thomas Kelvin of the Department of Geology, yet the rumors about him are still alive, growing stranger than the truth. Because those rumors are so distressing to his friends, the regents have at last agreed to let me publish his own narrative. For four or five years, Kelvin spent his vacations along the Pacific Slope of Mexico prospecting for uranium. The last summer, apparently he found it. Instead of returning to his classes in the fall, he asked for an extended leave. We heard later that he had sold his uranium claims to a Swiss syndicate that he was lecturing in Europe on the chemical and biological effects of atomic radiation, that he himself was under treatment at a clinic near Paris. He came back to Tyburn on a gloomy Saturday afternoon out of an early winter fog that was drifting off the Gulf Stream. I was at home raking leaves on the seaward slope of my place below the campus when I saw the boat coming in toward my rocky little scrap of Atlantic Beach. The boat was a stranger, long and low and fast, of the sort once favored by runners of illicit rum or guns, I dropped my rake to watch. Piloted with daring and skill, the boat threaded the offshore rocks toward the only yard of sand in half a mile. Four men sprang out to rush it through the surf. A gaunt fifth man rose in the stern, calling quiet orders. The four ripped ropes and canvas from a coffin-sized box, which they carried up into my yard. The gaunt man lipped stiffly to where I stood. Tyburn College? His men had dark faces, but his scarred and weather-reddened features were masked with a curly yellow beard, and his voice had a Yankee twang. Impatiently, he stabbed a lean finger toward the campus bell tower, dim in the fog. At last, I nodded. Here we are. He murmured soft Spanish to his men. Grinning, they set the long box down. He looked at me. Do you know a Professor Russell? I'm Russell. If that's so, our job's done. He gestured at the chest. It's for you. Huh? What is it? You'll find out. His hard eyes narrowed. I think you'll want to keep it quiet. He spoke to his men again, and they moved the chest to my back porch. Wait, who are you? Just delivery men. He gestured gently. We've been paid. We'll be on our way. He nodded to his men, who hurried toward the boat. But I don't understand. You'll find a letter in the box, he said. It explains why your friend took this way home. You'll see why he didn't want to trouble the immigration people. My friend? Kelvin, look in the box. He started back toward the boat. Just a minute, I shouted after him. Where are you going? South, he paused very briefly. Look in the box and give us 24 hours. Kelvin promised us that. Not hurrying, he limped on down to the boat. His men pushed it off the sand. The muffled motors purred. Turning in the surf, the long craft slid between the rocks and vanished in the fog. I walked slowly back to the chest on the porch. It was not locked. I lifted the lid and dropped it back again. Lying in the box, stark naked, that queer blot stamped in livid red on the bronze-green breast, was the metal man. A battered aluminum canteen lay beside his head, crusted with a purple stain. Beneath the canteen lay a sheaf of dog-eared pages covered with Kelvin's old-fashioned script. I had to nerve myself to lift the lid again. I bent for a long time, trembling and staring, unable to grasp what I saw. At last, I stumbled into the house and read Kelvin's narrative. Dear Russell, because you are my sanest friend, I have arranged to have my body and this manuscript delivered to you. Perhaps I am laying an unfair burden on you, but at this point I no longer trust myself. I am still uncertain what I really found in Mexico. I cannot decide whether these fragmentary facts should be published or suppressed, nor can I cope any longer with those ruthless men who want to rob me of what they think I found. Though my death will not be easy, I'm afraid I die in greater peace than I leave behind me. As you know, my goal last summer was the headwaters of El Rio de la Sangra. This is a small stream that flows into the Pacific. The year before, I had found a strong radioactivity in its red-stained waters, and I hoped to strike uranium ores somewhere upriver. Twenty-five miles above the mouth, the river emerges from the Cordilleras. 
There are a few miles of rapids and then the first waterfall. Nobody has ever been beyond the falls. I had reached their foot with a native guide, but failed to climb the cliffs beyond. Last winter, I took flying lessons and bought a used airplane. It was old and slow, but suited to that rough country. When summer came, I shipped it to Vaca Morena. On the first day of July, I set out to fly up the river to its undiscovered source. Though I was still an unseasoned pilot, the old plane flew well. The stream beneath me looked like a red snake crawling down through the mountains to the sea. I followed it beyond the falls into a region of towering peaks. The river disappeared in a narrow, black-walled gorge. I circled to look for a place to land, but the whole landscape was naked granite and jagged lava. I climbed over a high pass and found the crater. An incredible pool of green fire, fully ten miles across, walled with dark volcanic rock. At first I thought the green was water, but its hazy surface had no waves. I knew it must be some heavy gas. The high peaks around it still had snow. Their silver crowns were brushed a splendid color, crimson on the westward slopes, purple rising from the shadows. That wild glory held me, even while the feel of it disturbed me. Night was near. I knew I should be turning back. Yet I stayed, wheeling over the crater, because I couldn't understand that pool of gas. As the sun sank lower, I saw stranger things. A thin, greenish mist gathered over the peaks. It flowed down every slope into the pit, as if it fed that gas lake. Then something stirred the lake itself, the center of it bulged upward into a glowing dome. When the sluggish gas flowed back, I saw a huge red sphere rising out of the pit. Its surface was smooth, metallic, and thickly studded with great spikes of yellow fire. It spun very slowly on a vertical axis. Weird as it seemed, I sensed purpose in its motion. It climbed above my own level and paused there, still spinning. Now I saw a circular spot of dull black over each pole of the sphere. I saw misty streamers from the peaks and the pool drawn into those spots, as if the sphere somehow inhaled them. For a little time, the globe hung above me. The yellow spikes shone slowly brighter until the whole object blazed like a great golden planet while it sucked the last scraps of mist from the peaks. Suddenly, when they stood black and bare, it dropped back into that flat green sea. With its fall, a sinister shadow fell over the crater. With a start, I realized how much gasoline and daylight I had used. At once, I turned back toward the coast. More puzzled than afraid, I was trying to decide whether that thing from the pit had been natural or artificial, reality or illusion. I remember imagining the, that these enormous deposits of uranium might have unforeseen effects. It occurred to me, too, that perhaps somebody had got there ahead of me, and perhaps I had seen the trial of an atomic ship. With a shock of real alarm, I saw a pale blue glow spreading over the cowling of the cockpit. In a moment, the whole plane and even my body was covered with it. I gunned the motor and tried to climb. Though the motor labored, I couldn't climb. Some queer G-force connected, I thought, with that blue glow, was pulling me now. Dizziness dulled my thoughts, and my heavy arms began to drag at the controls. I had to dive to keep flying speed. Almost before I knew what was happening, I plunged into that gas lake. It was not suffocating, as I had expected. Though it cut visibility to just a few yards, I noticed no odor or other sensation. A dark surface loomed under me. I pulled out of the dive and managed to land on a smooth plane of coarse red sand. Like the green gas, the sand was dully luminous. For a time, I was confined to the cockpit by my own weight, but slowly that blue glow faded, along with its effect. I climbed out of the plane with my canteen and my automatic pistol, which were themselves still immensely heavy. Unable to stand erect, I crawled away across the sand. I felt sure I had been brought down by something intelligent. I was deathly afraid, yet soon I had to stop and rest. Lying there, perhaps a hundred yards from the plane, I saw five blue lights drifting toward it through the fog. I lay still and watched them wheel around the plane. Their motion was heavy and slow. The mist made dull halos around them. They had no structure that I could see. At last, they lifted back into the haze, and I went on. Though my excess gravity had faded away, I went on hands and knees until the plane was out of sight. When I stood up, my sense of direction was gone. A helpless fear swept over me. Bright red sand and thick green fog, that's all I could see. No landmark, not even a moving light. The soundless air pressed down like a shapeless weight. I trembled with a panic sense of utter isolation. I don't know how long I stood there, afraid of moving in the wrong direction. Suddenly a light darted above me like a blue meteor. In my alarm, I ran from that. After a few blundering steps, my foot struck something that rang like metal. The clatter froze me with new terror, but the light moved on. When it was gone, I bent to see what I had kicked. 
It was a metal bird, an eagle formed of metal, wings outspread, talons grasping, beak set open. Its color was a tarnished green. At first, I took it for a cast model of a real bird, but then I found each feather separate and flexible, as if a living eagle had been turned to metal. I remembered that fissioning uranium transmutes itself to lead and wondered if intense radiation could transmute the tissues of a bird. Fear seized me for my own body. Anxiously, I began to look for other transformed creatures. I found them in abundance, scattered over the sand or half buried in it. Birds, large and small, flying insects, most of them strange to me. Even a pterosaur, a flying reptile that must have reached that pit long ages past. Scrabbling to dig it out of the glowing sand, I saw a green glint from my own hands. The tips of my fingernails and the fine hairs on the back of my hands were already changed to light green metal. The shock of that discovery unnerved me completely. I screamed aloud, careless of what might hear, and ran off in blind panic. I forgot that I was lost. Reason and caution were left behind. I felt no fatigue as I ran, only black terror. Bright, swift lights passed above me in the green, but I gave them no heed. Unexpectedly, I came up to the great sphere I had seen from above. It rested motionless in a black metal cradle. The yellow fire was gone from the spikes, but a score of blue lights floated above it like lanterns swinging in a fog. I turned and ran again. Direction didn't matter, neither did time. What stopped me was at last a bank of queer vegetation. The stuff was violet in color, waist-deep and grass-like, with narrow spikes for leaves. The tallest center spikes were tipped with pink blooms and little purple berries. A sluggish red stream ran through the thicket. I thought it must be El Rio de la Sangre. Here, anyhow, was cover from the flying lights. I threw myself down in the deep tangle and lay there sobbing. For a long time, I couldn't stir or think. When at last I inspected my fingernails, the green tips looked wider. Frantically, I gnawed at them, but the hideous fact refused to go away. I was changing into metal. Wildly, I groped for a way to escape. I had to scale the crater walls or else recover the plane, yet I felt too weak to move. Though I felt no actual hunger, I thought food might give me strength. Recklessly, I picked a few of those purple berries. They had a salty, metallic taste. I spat them out, afraid they would make me ill. But in pulling them, I had got the juice on my fingers. When I wiped it off, I found to my amazement, my inexpressible joy, that the metal rim was gone from the nails it had touched. I had found hope. The evolution of the plants, I thought, must have produced something that resisted transmutation. I stuffed myself with berries till I began to feel sick, then poured the water from my canteen and squeezed juice to fill it. Since then, I have analyzed the fluid. Some of its constituents resemble the standard formulas for the treatment for x-ray burns. It doubtless saved me from the terrible burns caused by gamma radiation. I lay there till dawn, dozing sometimes in spite of my terror. Sunlight must have filtered down through that pool of gas. By day, the green faded to a greenish-gray, and even the red sand seemed less luminous. All the green, I found, was now gone from my nails and hair. Immensely cheered by that, I ate another handful of the berries and set off along that little river. I walked downstream, counting my paces. Before I had gone three miles, I came to the pitch-blend cliffs. Abrupt and black, they towered up as far as I could see into the thick green gloom. The river disappeared beneath them in a roaring pool of red foam. This, I felt sure, must be the west rim of the crater. I turned north beneath that unclimbable wall. Still, I had no definite plan except to find a path across the cliff. I kept alert for those floating lights and looked for a slope or a chimney that I could climb. I plodded on until it must have been noon, though my watch had stopped. Sometimes I stumbled over more things that must have been alive when they fell from above. Uprooted trees, birds of every sort, a huge green bear, its breed long extinct. At last, I found a break in that vertical wall, a wide, flat shelf with an inviting slope above it. But that ledge was a good 60 feet above me. I tried to reach it and slid back again and again until my hands were bleeding. I gave up and went on. Somewhere beyond, groggy with exhaustion and despair, I staggered into a city of the flying lights. That's what it must have been. Slim black towers stood scattered across the red sand. Each one was topped with a great mushroom of orange flame. Fresh terror paralyzed me, but I heard no sound and saw no motion. Crouching under the overhanging cliff, I tried to take stock. The flying lights, I now suspected, were not active by day, but I felt sick with dread of the night. By my reckoning, I had made about 15 miles from the river. Now I must be somewhere along the east wall of the crater, with a good half of the cliff still ahead. To explore them, I had to pass that city of flames, yet I dared not enter it. I left the rim to walk around the city. 
I tried to keep those tall flares in view, but somehow I lost them. I veered to the left, but all I found was more flat sand smothered under dull green murk. On and on I wandered until the sand and the air grew brighter. Dusk had fallen. The floating lights were soon in motion. The night before, they had gone straight and high and fast. Now they were low, uncertain, and slow. I knew they were searching for me. I scooped out a shallow trench in the sand and lay there shivering. Mist-veiled points of light came near and passed. Another stopped directly overhead. It sank toward me. Its pale halo grew. Paralyzed with terror, I could only wait. Down and down it came until I saw its form. It was a crystal thing. I watched it with a sick fascination. A dozen feet long, it had an intricate structure like a crystal of snow. The heart of it was a blue six-pointed star. An upright prism pierced the star. Blue fire pulsed through it, flowing inward from the points of the star, and threads of bright scarlet trailed outward from the faces of the prism. Neither animal nor plant nor even machine it was alive, alive with light. It fell straight toward me. In a reflexive act of panic, I pulled my automatic and fired three shots. The bullets glanced off those glittering planes and whined away into the fog. It paused above me. Those threads of red fire trailed down around me, questingly, somehow caressingly. They wound around my body, and I felt my weight drained out. They lifted me against the crystal prism. You may see its mark on my chest. That contact stunned me with blinding pain. My whole body writhed, as if from a cruel electric shock. Dimly, I knew the thing was rising with me. I had a sense of other crystal creatures swarming near, but my mind was fading out. I awoke floating free in a brilliant orange cloud. For a moment, I felt elated, but then I found I couldn't move, couldn't even turn my body. I reached and kicked and twisted, but I could touch no solid object. Though nothing held me, I was helpless as a turtle on its back. My body was still clothed. My canteen still hung or floated by my shoulder. My automatic was still in my jacket pocket, solid but weightless. Yet somehow I knew that days had passed. Struggling to move myself, I felt a queer, numb stiffness in my side. I ripped my shirt open and found a new scar there, almost healed. I believed those creatures had cut into me, exploring my body, suppose, as I had explored their world. I must have blacked out again when I felt the hardened, granular deadness of the skin over my chest and found that red, six-sided print. Yet that discovery brought me to some limit of emotion. I woke in a mood of remote detachment, as if I didn't really care. But my side still hurt. The orange cloud was still around me. My crystal captor was drifting in it with me, not a dozen yards away. In my cool unconcern, I knew that I was trapped in the mushroom cloud, above one of those towering cylinders, a prisoner in that alien city of flame, watching my own predicament from that mood of aloof ab- abstraction. Indifferently, I observed that the vital fire had ceased to pulse inside the crystal creature. It was sleeping, I suppose, till night came again. That chain of thought lit a faint spark of hope in me. Once more, I kicked and clawed at the cloud around me. With nothing to push against, I failed to move an inch. While I struggled like a bug on a pin, that cold flame grew slowly brighter around me. Night, I knew, was falling. The crystal things would soon awake, no doubt to resume the vivisection of their human guinea pig. I could see only one way to cheat them. I was pulling my automatic to put a bullet in my own head when a better idea hit me. I fired six quick shots out into the fog. That move saved me. A rocket needs nothing to push against. The gun was a sort of rocket. The recoil of each explosion nudged me farther from the sleeping crystal. I slid out of the mushroom cloud. Gravity caught me again, at first very gently. Drifting down to the luminous sand, I found my airplane drawn up to the foot of that slim black tower. It was intact. The motor balked for a moment, as if my captors had been into it as well as into me. At last it caught. I took off blind. At this point, there's a break in the manuscript. The remaining lines are on another tattered page. They seem to be in Kelvin's old-fashioned hand, but here it is a ragged pencil scrawl, not always readable. End of my rope. Guess I diluted the canteen too many times. My body and effects I will to science. Captain Gander will supply the conclusion of my story. The frightening truth, that was all. I called my physician. He's a sour-featured Scotch Presbyterian who doesn't care for the 20th century. He read the manuscript with an air of indignant unbelief, scowled over the transmuted body, and dourly advised me to keep the story quiet. That might have been prudent, but it proved impossible. Too many people heard tantalizing rumors. Some came, I'm afraid, from my faculty colleagues at Tyburn. 
Others, I'm sure, did not. Though Captain Gander has never come forward with whatever he knows, we tried to learn the rest of the story. The next summer, three of us from Tyburn chartered our own airplane and flew to western Mexico. We easily found the coastal village that Senor Kelvin had visited once, but not, its people insisted, within the past three years. We talked to the men who had guided him back into the high Sierra. We even followed up the rocky bed of that mountain stream where he had hunted uranium. Its waters were now neither red nor radioactive, however, and its source was only a boggy spring. Flying over that spring and peaks beyond, we found no crater filled with glowing gas, but only another stone and adobe pueblo 300 years old. When we landed there, we discovered no metal birds or living crystals or atomic ships. We did, however, hear of three strangers who had been there before us. One was a limping, bearded gringo who had asked mad questions and cursed those who could not answer to please him. One was an elegant Swiss banker who had wondered about the Pueblo carrying a Geiger counter and staring at everybody with a monocle like an evil eye. The third was another gringo who had come three summers from the north and driven in onto the high Cordillera hauling tarp-covered crates in an old military truck. Among such confusing clues, we lost Kelvin's trail in Mexico. There were other mysterious strangers, however, who followed us back to Tyburn. Some of them were federal investigators who questioned all of us, searched Kelvin's premises, photocopied his documents, and finally carried his transmuted body away for study by the AEC. When they finally returned the body to Tyburn, they were remarkably tight-lipped and silent, even for federal men. No official report has ever mentioned the metal man, and the rumors that still circulate sometimes around him are wildly contradictory. Part of the truth had been concealed, but I don't know who to blame. There's Captain Gander, who surely owns another name and quite possibly doctored Kelvin's manuscript. There's the Swiss banker, who used to sit in the cantina reading a French translation of Wells' time machine, never talking to anybody. There's the AEC, whose ancients certainly learned more than they ever told. There's Kelvin himself, who may have been lying to hide what he actually discovered. But I've come to believe that Kelvin's story is true. I spent a good many sleepless nights reviewing all the conflicting evidence until the time I had a vivid dream of strangers visiting the Earth, perhaps to refuel their atomic ship, which lay hidden in time as well as space while they were collecting and preserving stray specimens of pterosaurs and men. However that may be, Kelvin's metal body, standing nude and scarred and dusty now in its gloomy corner, is proof enough that he did discover more than he was looking for. His lips are frozen in a green, ironic smile, almost as if he is aware that civil defense has designated the museum basement where he stands as an emergency fallout shelter. And that's the end.